Uh, this is the Camden Harbor Committee meeting, November 10th, 2000, or 2020. It's 8.30 in the morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, the first thing on the agenda, will Army Corps update? We'll wait on that. So we'll move right on to uh, non-agenda items. Bob. Good. Yes. Thanks for recognizing my hand, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have much time this morning, and uh, good to see all your faces. Haven't seen a lot of you in a long time. Um, but um, just to follow on from a pre, uh, and I just want to make a couple of comments, and unfortunately, I have to head out of town. But um, about the last, uh, I think it was last select board meeting or the one before, where we did discuss uh, an issue and, and decided during the meeting that we would uh, be interested in the opinions of the Harbor Committee, um, and specifically, it re was regard to the <clears throat> the possibility that um, 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 uh, it, if it wins at some point in time, a license should not be renewed. Uh, what would the recommendation of the of the what should be the recommendation or, or if any stuff of the board? Um, we'd just be interested in some input from at some point in time. It doesn't have to be today, of course, because I, I don't believe it's in your agenda, Mark, at this point. Um, uh, yes, but, it is. Okay. Well, the um, <clears throat> excuse me. Basically, the question that came up in the board meeting was if a license wasn't um, to be renewed, or what would what should be the thought process of the select board in the town? Um, I know this is a complicated question because it's kind of a hypothetical at this point in time. Um, but uh, to that end, I want to rec remind the board. You know, this I'm sorry, the committee, <clears throat> as we do with all committees, that. We don't need to have a you know a black and white answer to the question. We just be interested in some inputs, and specifically, I'm sure there'd be varied opinions, and that's fine. Um, but uh, when we ever get a chance to discuss it, we'd like to hear those varied opinions and why. Um, <clears throat> what, what what are the supporting <clears throat> arguments for the various cases? I think it's really important to underscore that what I just said because too often. <clears throat> so some of our committees have come up, have this notion that we're looking for, you know, uh, the committee voted four to three to do this or five to two to, to, to recommend. We don't, that's not what we're talking about. In fact, in, in general, obviously, you know, we have committees to talk to, we'll be able to do some of the work that we don't have time to do. Um, uh, it may be just some discussion, uh, perhaps even investigation, some data, who knows what, depending on the topic. That's what we have here. Uh, uh, that we're talking about something just, you know, uh, should we just ignore it completely, stop worrying about it, and just, just go on with business as usual? Um, uh, are there concerns about the future yeah. of the harbor? Um, are there uh, not? Um, you know, and again, a general discussion. If you, if you can do that, it'd be great. And at some point, Mark, um, perhaps you could come to the select board in the next month or so and have a conversation uh, about the conversation that you're having. Okay, thank you. Is Robert, that, Bob. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Bob. You're on mute, Bob. You're on mute. Bob, you're you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, people uh, wish they could do that more. But <laughs> I, the question is, is your issue what standard to apply if you're terminating? a license or if a license becomes open, what do you do if there are multiple people wanting one license? Uh, yeah, that's, you, well, yeah, yes, that's certainly one of the questions. Um, if, if a license were not to be re renewed for any reason, um, what, should the, what should the select board of the town consider? And in, in one, either repl replacing it or not, um, um, uh, that would only come to a fruition, of course, if you were concerned if, uh, about the, Mm, uh, overuse or uh, over yeah overuse of the harbor or if what should the, what should the priorities be for for uh, for um, uh, choosing and what should the process be for choosing yeah that's a good that's but a good it's, question it's how to fill the how to how and whether to fill an opening not how thank to create you. one you're you're more succinct than I am thank you Bob okay All right, Mark. I hope I haven't okay. I hope I haven't turned your meeting on end. But I think, and by the way, to that uh, point I made about decisions, it, it applies to almost everything on, on committees. Uh, uh, we're we're always looking for input 
on uh, on things we don't have time to look at and we understand that never almost never is complete consensus on any issue um, and we're always interested in hearing the the various uh, positions and why uh, that's extremely important well and, and to follow up on that bob i think everybody should should take a look at the harbor ordinance and uh, especially the the responsibilities of the Harbor Committee. Mm -hmm. It's spelled out fairly clearly there that, that we are advisory to the select board. We're not here to make decisions and rulings, but we're here to, to do the research and help the select board making their decisions. Agree with that, Bob? Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. I mean, the, I, I, yeah, I don't get into a lot of lectures here. I don't want to take your important time, but, you know, we do have a committee guidelines and that, and that they do say exactly that for all committees. And yes, in this case, it happens to be an ordinance that has a little bit more about the uh, Harbor Committee. Yes, it is advisory, of course, um, but um, that's neither here nor there. Like I said, it's, it's um, uh, your, your, your advice doesn't have to be black and white, I guess is my point, Mark, as we've discussed in the past. And I think that's really important. It takes some of the pressure. We, we didn't want to, what I'm saying this is because we didn't, I didn't want the select board to take uh, an elephant and throw it in the room. That's not fair. You know, we don't have any answers. We have very, I'm sure we have varied opinions. I haven't asked them, but uh, we'd be interested in any various opinions of the, of the Harbor Committee. Make sense? Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Elliot, go ahead. Do we have openings imminent? No, not to my knowledge. Okay, so uh, we can continue with the meeting then with uh, non-agenda items. Anybody? No? So uh, next is uh, approval of the October 6th minutes. We have any uh, a motion to approve the minutes? Any discussion on the minutes? Has anybody read the minutes? I read them. Joshua. <laughs> so I'll move to approve them. <clears throat> the, only, the only minor note that I noticed was in the select board liaisons section. It said that Taylor Benzie was absent on October 10th. And I, I think she meant October 6th. On October 6th. Okay. Bob, you uh, make a motion to approve. For the amendment? Approve as amended. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second that. Josh seconds. All in favor, raise your hand. Um, I mean, I wasn't there, so I can either, either way. You're abstaining? Abstain. Okay, yeah. so uh, that's approved. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. So the next thing is the uh, day sailors, uh, day sailor and wind jammer review. That's up to you, Steve. Yeah. So do you, hi guys, do you have um, a copy of, of the actual agreements in front of you? No. Not the agreements, no. But okay. Well, what we did with the uh, agenda for this morning was your uh, uh, individual reviews of the- Oh yeah, good. Uh, have you had a chance to read them over? Yes. I have, yes. I have. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to, if there's any questions about like my comment or my report, um, I'd like to field them now and talk, talk about any any ideas or any questions you have about anything to do about the review that, that you have in front of you. So Steve, I was just generally concerned that the majority seem to have a problem with headway speed. What are you doing to work on that? Uh, well, last meeting, we the committee agreed to uh, advise me to go ahead and invest some money on 
some new markers, which we did. Um, I'm also working on getting the anchor systems for them. So we're going to have a lot more markers um, going down the uh, channel that remind people of the headway speed only. And I'm also going to become a little more aggressive in the beginning of the season, having a, a meeting with the key people uh, that are always going in and out, the fishermen, the day sailors, the launches. Um, I mean, and, that's my concern. This isn't visitors. These are accomplished, regular users of the harbor. And if they're consistently, for whatever reason, just not following protocol, that's alarming. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Kathy. Uh, another thing is, is that they don't realize it, but they are setting the, the example yeah. for yeah. the visitors. So the visitors come in and say, oh, I guess it's okay to go that fast. And yeah. maybe, maybe I'll even go faster, uh, you know. Because I watch them come and go, and I have noticed um, wakes and various things. Yeah. Pretty soon, though, I won't be able to see them come and go, but that's another story. Yeah, so um, so that's the only only issue that I wanted to put forth, and uh, and I'm going to be more aggressive next, right in the beginning of next season. Hey, Steve? Yeah. Bruce here. Um, can you define headway speed? Does that mean no wake at all, or does it mean under five knots, or...? Um, yeah, the way the way it's described, headway speed is is the slowest your vessel can go and still have st uh, steerage ability. So still that's one knot actually... or less. How's that? That's, that's like a knot or a knot and a half. That's it. It obviously, it obviously depends what type of vessel, but it's about it's about two knots, three okay. knots, and that's all the way in from the outer harbor where the uh, five knot. Uh, uh, buoys are all the way. Uh, yes, in, the, the, in any federal navigable waterway, that oh. is a federal. That's a federal law. Okay. So when I go up to people, um, and I do, I do stop a lot of people, and um, and I've trained my deputies to do it the same way I do. We don't want to get into a fight. We don't want to get people upset. We just get in front of them, we put our lights on, and then they slow down. And um, ninety nine percent of them say, "Oh, am I going too fast?" <laughs> like they, they know why they're getting stopped. Um, and I just remind them, yep, in a federal navigable waterway, it's headway speed only. Thank you. And then I, and then I leave. All right. Thank you. Well, I have a concern whether we're talking about the inner harbor, which is basically what I consider to be the Wayfarer corner, or the, from there to those outer buoys, I... And honestly, you know, I, and I'm, I would be concerned about the inner part. Uh, I see the boats go by all the time. I'm not, you know, GPSing their speed. And I don't see there being a problem after the 90 degree corner at the Yacht Club and, the, and Wayfarer. Uh, and uh, if it's truly headway speed only, then, then the launches are violating it constantly. Basically, everyone is. So I do share the concern for, you know, the truly inner harbor where those floats are and all the float mooring type things. But uh, when you get further around the corner and you're going in front of the, the big condos and the launching ramp area, et cetera, I, I don't actually see it as a problem. Well, but that's the because you might, not, interpreting be, it. you might right. not be viewing it from your kayak. I'd like to uh, interrupt here uh, now. Um, Adam is now with us, so why don't we shift to uh, his presentation and come back to this? Yes, Go hi ahead. everyone. Can you hear me by the by the way? Yes. Excellent. I'm Love just clear. trying to download some of my. Um, this has just been a little bit complicated because I I had to switch to my my own computer and then I'm downloading. My the documents, uh, so that's what I'm just trying to do right now. But uh, I'll, uh, if you want, uh, if you could just give me another five minutes, then I'll be all set. If oh, okay. You, okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to shift back to uh, reviews. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, Bob, I understand exactly what you're, what you I think what you were trying to say. Um, for me, I'm actually maybe thinking about drawing like an actual chart with concentral circles 
inside the uh, inner harbor, you know, that's like, that's like the bullseye. You, you should be really, really careful about, you know, paying attention to your wake and not disturbing the inner harbor. Once you get to the next level out, which would be around steamboat landing and in, in the close mooring fields, uh, um, then, you know, I don't particularly mind if you, if you crank it up a little bit more than two, two knots, you should be able to go five miles per hour, you know, right around there. And then as you get further out, as long as you're in control of your wake and responsible for your wake, you know, you know, way out in Sherman's Cove and that I don't particularly, you know, again, it's, it gets to be, it's, it's not that big of an issue. So it just has to do with a little bit more management and we're, I'm going to get my team together and we're going to see if we can, you know, make it so it's not an issue. Obviously the federal navigable waterway, that's a federal law. That's not, that's not our waterways ordinance. You know, people have to respect that. Oh, you've uh, articulated oh. it is fine with me and my, but I would add the concern on the, the truly inner Harbor section. It's not just about wake. You have a lot of people coming from odd angles and doing things. And so if you're going five knots there in a 50 foot boat, uh, and you're going to be able to respond quickly to someone pulling out or whatever, you're going too fast. Yeah. It's not just the wake. It's, it's being able to, it's just a more congested area. It's like a exactly. parking lot. Yep. Okay. So to stay on point, we're uh, discussing wind jammers and day sailors and, and the, in, in those letters, uh, you discussed uh, payments and lack of payments and agreements and lack of agreements. And um, I think we need to discuss that. Uh, the other thing I, I'd like is uh, a report on the wind jammers and uh, you know, who, where do the agreements stand there? Where do the payments stand there? Go ahead, Steve. Well, it if you want, I can, I can let Liz tell you about where we are with the actual wind jammers um, and, what, and what's going on there. Because as far as I, I've been told is that the wind jammers, what was it, they didn't even pay? A the um, agreements didn't go out. Um, they're finalized, but they never, the wind jammers never received their agreements. So therefore there was no payments. And I believe it was under agreement that they were not going to run this season. So there's nothing that went out to the wind jammers. What about because, what, of, the, because of the pandemic? Right. Didn't didn't one wind jammer didn't the mistress run this year? I thought that was the only one that actually ran. Yeah, the mistress was the only one who was able to to go because of the fact that she was a six pack. But so did it run without a without a license, without an agreement or? I, yeah, I believe it did. I believe it ran without a contractual agreement. Hmm. Was so, there any, any discussion of uh, the boats that are tied up there, you know, with the selectmen or whatever, that they might not be paying their normal fees, but do they pay rent for using the docks all summer? Well, Bob, uh, that, that is what the select board has asked us to um, review and advise them on. Um, what, the way I understand it, what they, the, the, their statement was that they will postpone collecting the payments for now with a determination later after the season of how things went. So that's the discussion we need to have here. That Mark, yes, uh, Mark, yeah, yeah you, you accurately stated. Um, when the season started, we were in the turmoil, especially in the select board in the town of, of this virus thing going on, and um, very clearly we were trying to do everything we could with businesses of all kinds that we couldn't do a lot with other businesses, unfortunately, because of our form of government. But trying to, you know, to assuage people about you know we're gonna we're here to help we're not here to stick something in your back just because an agreement says so so we did make the statement as i recall that said um you know if you don't make the payment don't panic we'll we'll have to work on that and and we have not to date and and need to address that as far as uh, this uh, this uh, past summer for the wind jammers and for the day sailors we have not 
a final determination on that matter. So, do we, you know, with that said, I mean, we, uh, I, sorry, Adam, are you? I'm all set. So I'm all ready? set, by the way. If, uh, if you want to switch over or just give me. Yeah, let's switch over because this could be a very lengthy conversation. <laughs> <laughs> let's drop the hot potato for now. <laughs> oh, I didn't want to interrupt. I just wanted to tell you I'm ready. I'm ready uh, as best I can. <laughs> Great. Okay. You're on then, Adam. Okay, and how do I share my screen when that time comes? Is right down at the bottom. Oh, share I see the, share screen, right? Share, there you go. Okay, I'm going to do that now then. And let's see if I can figure this out here. Photo Camden Harbor. Here we go. Double click it, I guess. Can you see what I'm doing now? No. Oh, I see that you've got three. There you go. There. Okay, you've got it now. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is uh, this was our, our uh, initial appraisal of federal interest that we prepared back in 2015. Uh, actually, I guess by the time we got it to you, it was uh, late 2015, 2016. So it was about four, almost five years ago now. And uh, so I'm just going to show you very briefly, uh, just go through and show you the, um, this is, these are some of the options that we came up with. This was an outer harbor protection, just an example of what could work, though we probably would want to even enhance it further by putting a, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, right? Yes. That yes. Fine. Yeah, where well, we would actually extend out and narrow down this uh, this opening further to even yeah. further protect this entire basin in here, you know, the outer and inner harbor. And uh, so that, and these would be breakwaters, and we'd use what we could to build on existing high structures like this whole ledge through here. The, the inner ledge and the outer ledge is here. And then this would just be trying to block off some of the current, some of the waves energy that comes in straight through between Curtis Island and Dillingham Point. But there's a lot of wave energy that comes through here as well. And so we'd probably, if we could, we'd build something out right from Curtis Island mm -hmm. out into the it gets deep here fast though, so it would take a lot of stone. That's the only problem, as you can see, right? Right. <laughs> 37 feet. So it would take a lot of stone to build something out here. You know, maybe it would be, you know, somewhere where we'd extend something out like this or something like this. But anyway, that that this scenario right here is what we looked at. To come up with a cost. And this is another, uh, and this shows you some of the cubic yardage 21,000, 37,000, and 15,000 cubic yards of material. Um, then we had an inner harbor design. Um, and I know that we would have to change that now because we had talked about, um, I mean, now, now you have this deauthorization over here, right? Does that happen even? That's that's pending. It's pending. But you probably want that protected as well. And so my my understanding was that the the uh, Camden was not necessarily interested in an inner harbor only protection. You were interested in in the outer, uh, more like this this prior scenario here where we're protecting more of this entire harbor from uh, storm energy. Is, is that my understanding still, or is that Camden's thoughts on this? I uh, Maybe I'll just jump in here. Um, I think that's correct, and maybe Steve could, could chime in too, but I just want to preface this um, with, for everyone that the town reached out to the Army Corps a number of years ago, requested the Army Corps to look at this to protect the harbor from storms. 
i.e. loss of commercial uses, limiting, um, and the storms that limit recreational and seasonal, seasonal uses. So the town did reach out to the Army Corps, and this is what the Army Corps um, developed based on us reaching out to them. They did determine that there's a federal interest determination was um, appropriate. Yeah, and so what we use, we use this scenario that would protect both the inner and outer harbor. And when we look at the, uh, the economic uh, benefits, we looked at the both inner and outer harbor benefits, and uh, there's benefits to both. So we could probably, if we had to, we could probably justify either the inner or the outer harbor development. But what we do is we just compared the benefits that we came up with, um, you know, million dollars in annual benefits. And that's just using formulas about uh, how much it would cost to, to, to repair damages to vessels and losses in, uh, you know, in, in, um, in labor and having to pull floats and so forth and damages. And so we added all those up. Uh, don't, I don't, I'm not definitely not gonna go into the details other than when all was said and done, we had an annual cost. Uh, we, had, we estimated, by the way, that it was about a $12 million, it doesn't really show up very well here, but I'll show it to you later, but um, about a $12 million project. And that and the annual cost of that project would be about $569,000. So there'd be a net benefit of uh, $505,000 a year, which means that we would have, you know, and a, a benefit to cost ratio of 1.89. And that's how we can justify, we have to say that what it costs on an annual basis versus the benefits is, um, the benefits are greater than the cost. So we showed this here during this um, 2015 study. And I wanted to show you very quickly. Uh, uh, Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Where, what that relatively huge labor cost savings, I can't think of what that would constitute. What makes that up? Oh, where are some of those? I, uh, we, in this study there, and I could forward everyone this study again, it has the economics report mm -hmm. and it, it, and some of that, that is in there. Uh, I'll get to it here in a minute, just a second here Sorry about this. This is a, the lengthy analysis that was conducted on, on wave energy and so forth. Um, well, I don't want to sidetrack your report. It just, it was a pretty big number and I could imagine what the other things were referring to, but not that one. Okay. By the way, so here, here's the cost. This is what we came up with was, um, was, inner versus outer we had for the we had total stone um, tons outer ledge inner ledge you know and um, Dillingham point so we came up with the cubic yardage and uh, the total stone was 73,000 cubic yards or 113,000 uh, tons and that's the very minimum. I think that if we built out, uh, I had another drawing that showed uh, building out from Curtis Island into that deep water, we could even maybe see doubling this quantity here. So, but just simply using this quantity to 73,000 cubic yards and with estimates that we had back in 2015 for other projects where we had to <clears throat> deliver stone on a barge and then have it placed. 
uh, that's where we came up with a, uh, a cost estimate of approximately $12, $12 million for that job. And uh, now we're thinking it could be quite a bit higher than that if we get these, you know, it, these are the numbers we were using, $130 a ton, $75 a ton for, uh, $130 a ton for the very large stone, you know, the 10,000 pound or five ton stone. And then anything smaller would be a uh, half ton, would be $75 a ton and then $58 a ton for the 100 pound core stone. And, you know, when you look at all those numbers here, this is really where the bulk of the cost is, is getting the stone to the site. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up for a, a po per point, because when you see that the total cost gets over around $12 million here, the problem that we are running into now is that when we, if we were to do one of two options, if we continue the project under the continuing authorities program, which is this section 107 of the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Harbor River Harbors Act. Act, yeah. So that would be the process in which you would sign, the, the town would sign F, uh, a feasibility cost sharing agreement with, with the core, and then we would cost share 50-50 this study cost, which could be as much as four hundred to $600,000 to complete the full feasibility study. So we would share that 50-50 after signing a feasibility cost share agreement. And we just move straight ahead into that. We already have uh, approval to move ahead with that. But the, the problem is that headquarters through Congress has asserted that no longer will they accept any projects that go over the federal limit. If we already know that the federal limit and, and the federal limit is $10 million. So if we already know that we're gonna go over the federal limit, they will stop us in our tracks uh, at the headquarters level. Even if we put this, if we put this uh, feasibility cost share agreement together and try to get it signed, it, it, we won't be able to move it forward. If we show these costs that, that we have presented now, which means that we were over the million dollar, I mean the $10 million federal limit. Um, and by the way, the cost sharing for construction, design and construction is 10% uh, sponsor, 90% federal. So let's say we're spending 12, 13, 14 million dollars total, then the federal contribution would be about 11 to 12 million dollars, which would be capped at 10. So we'd, we'd have to cap it at 10 and you would be having to contribute all the rest, which would be uh, not just 10%, but it would be 10% plus all the additional which could be as much as four, you know three, four, four million dollars if the town would have to kick in. And again, because our limit is ten million, and that would mean we could only cover a ten million dollar project plus ten percent of the town's contribution, which would be eleven million. So really, if it goes over eleven million, we're we're pretty much done. Where we'd have to go through another program, which is the general investigations, which is a congressionally designated, congressionally authorized project. So, now, if we want to continue with this 107, section 107 study, we would need very clear evidence from the town that you would be able to 
help us get bids, you know, estimates that are a lot lower than this $130 a ton right here. That would be, and if we can't show that, if there's no way to prove that or document that and have our cost estimators, you know, be comfortable with that, then we're pretty much stuck with having to go through these general investigation study. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Um, thanks for bringing that up. I think um, Steve and I did look at um, cost estimates, um, you know, here revised cost basis anyways, um, locally. Um, Steve, maybe you can chime in, but I, I have the spreadsheet that we put together when you chatted with Crotch Island folks. Um, yeah. Corey up there, it looks like we came up with an estimate, revised estimate of 8.9 million. Um, and that was obviously a year ago um, before oh. COVID and all this, but 8.9 million and the cost per ton came down significantly is $25 a ton for pretty much every um, every um, size of stone we needed, but. You said $25 a ton? Correct. Wow. And that's and that's hauled to the site on a barge or something like that? Yeah, we've got an estimate for the barge cost and all that as well included, and we came in at 8.9 million. Okay. Uh, well, so again, there's there's two two different scenarios. One of them is we proceed this way, Jeremy, where you present that to me. You know, you send me everything you can, and then I'll work with our cost estimators to see if they would be comfortable with you know with modifying this spreadsheet that I'm showing to you right now. If we can modify these and get this cost down, then I think we could convince, it's not so much convincing me, it's, con, uh, it's convincing our division that, uh, that we're conf confident and comfortable that, you know, that our estimates are going to, to be um, in, in more of the level you're talking about, Jeremy. Because again, back three years ago, we have been able to sneak, we had been able to sneak through feasibility studies by just saying, yeah, we understand we're close, we might go over, but the town understands or the sponsor understands that they, they're just gonna have to come up with all the additional money. You know, and it could be millions, everything over that, you know, I was saying about $11 million threshold would be 100% town. But now what they're saying is, again, just to repeat this, they're saying if we're not even gonna allow that to happen. If, if you know already upfront that the town's gonna have to, the sponsor's gonna have to kick in additional money and it's over that $11 million threshold, then we have, it, we're really going beyond the authority that Congress has given us. I mean, that's, that's been the interpretation is that Congress is then saying, no, we didn't authorize the use of this continuing authorities program for projects that go over 11 million. You're gonna to have to go and request this directly through Congress. Okay, so what we're gonna to have to do is convince, uh, I'm gonna to have to convince my supervisors and then up the chain that we indeed have a project that we think is going to stay under that, you know, 11, $12 million threshold. And so that's where the town would, you know, would have to really help come up with, um, Something that when we go out, we, we can, can, we're feeling confident that if we went out to bid, that this material would be available or somehow be provided where it would keep the estimate down. Adam, a question. Um, when you talk about that cost share that the town would have to kick in, it, for these projects, I know I'm familiar with some federal um, grant projects, and oftentimes you can't use other grant funding other federal dollars um, as a 
match. Is that the same for Army Corps project like this? Say, for instance, the Northern Border Regional Commission or the Economic Development Administration decided that this was a worthwhile project. Could we use some of their funding for for this at all or no? Do you know? Uh, most federal dollars, it's either grants from a federal source, would we could throw that into the mix, but it would not be considered a match. It would reduce the overall cost of the project. And we've done that before where we oh. take other federal money and it reduces the overall cost of the federal response of the core responsibility. I, I had a, a project where US Fish and Wildlife was kicking in a bunch of money and we were not gonna match that money, but they were just gonna pay for a portion of the project through that money. But that would lower the, the cost, the percentage that the town would need to kick in then in the end, correct? Yeah, it, it would definitely lower the cost of the town because you would not be cost sharing that portion, right? Right. Uh, and then if it's non-federal money, it was state money, uh, depends on where the money came from, but in some, if it's entirely state or local, that's, that obviously could be used directly as your match. Okay. And if it is federal, there are certain federal monies that get given to the states that can be used as match, but generally speaking, that would be an exception that if there are federal grants given to the states, that that's still considered federal money. But yes, they could be used to reduce the overall cost. But the question I need to ask, uh, the experts, I guess, is if, the, if there's a federal, if there's monies being kicked in to reduce the overall cost and therefore and not the overall cost, but the overall contribution that you say or the core has to kick in. Would that be a way to to reduce the uh, the cost share? You know what I mean, and keep it within one hundred and seven study. Well, that's the answer for you right now. It sounds to me that with our new cost estimates that were below the $10,000 or $10 million number. Yes. And so what, I, I don't understand if, if that happens, what would the holdup be? So there, there wouldn't be if we can, uh, if let's say Jeremy, uh, you know, you and I present this information and we have a convincing argument that uh, that when it comes, we have good confidence that when it comes to construction, that we will have this avenue to uh, for the for the stone. How, for instance, how how would you how would we uh, get this stone? Would we have a contractor's bid on the stone, or would we have? Uh, would the town supply the stone? I'm just trying to figure out how we could uh, do this so that we could guarantee that that stone would be um, like, I'm wondering if, it's, if, it, if, if the town could supply the stone. You know what I mean? Right. It's part of your cost, your in-kind cost. Well, Jeremy, Jeremy and Steve, you, you, you got an estimate. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Steve got an estimate. And I guess um, I guess one question I would have for Adam in the Army Corps is, I mean, I've done a fair amount of projects using federal dollars and, you, you know, you end up having to follow, you know, Davis-Bacon Act and every other act um, and yeah. rule that the feds have when it comes to, um, you know, putting things out to bid or getting projects um, in the works. I would just want to make sure that we're okay. And this is something that Adam and Steve and I could probably um, get into, but, you know, if the town was able to sole source, you know, rock from say Crotch Island, 
and we didn't put it out to bid. We just worked, reached out to someone and we got a price. Is that sufficient? Um, and does that work for the Army Corps? Yeah. And that's a, I think, I think that, uh, Jeremy, you, Steve, and I could, um, we could have a, a call. I think just to us have a talk with, uh, with my supervisor. And first, why don't you share with me your cost estimate? Uh, that, would, sure. that would be helpful. And then uh, I'll explain this scenario and then we can then have a, a conference call with uh, two other people at the core here locally. And see whether or not, first of all, it could be that you have enough compelling evidence that this cost estimate could be reduced substantially. Uh, or we talk about a sole source or a sponsor, like a sponsor supplied material. Yep. And by the way, there is, there is the ability to do in-kind services. So if the town says we will supply the stone and the stone meets the specifications, then you know they obviously have to meet the specifications and we would make sure they do. Um, and, and we would just simply, that would be your match. You know what I mean? Would be an in-kind in value there. And the way the in-kind services works is it's at your actual cost. So in other words, if you purchase the stone, then you would just, it would be simply those receipts. And that would be the actual, we would give you upfront, we would be knowing that you would be providing that in-kind cost. And we could then come up with federal dollars to match that in-kind uh, value. So, but if our contribution is only 10%, then, I mean, that's certainly, it doesn't cover the cost of the stone. I mean, we're, we're talking about a million dollars for the town to kick in, but it looks to me like the stone is going to be, oh yeah, the stone is the bulk of the, the project. No, you're right. Yeah, so, so that, that would, sense. we'd have to, um, Okay, well. Why don't Steve and I and Adam um, <laughs> hammer some of this out? A That's a really good point that it's, it's actually gonna be a lot more than your match. Right. So right. then, so that. We could buy half the stone. Yeah, or something, but let's just see how, right. I'm yes. just trying to figure out a way to get the stone to make sure we're guaranteed that stone price, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and not uh, because I think if we give the contractor an option, you can get this stone or another stone. What we we have to be sure is that we're pretty confident that there'll be a that there'll be a contractor who will bid on knowing that that stone's available. We'll base their bid on knowing that that cheaper stones available. Which just boils down to getting getting a, a, a bid um, through, I mean, wh whenever the project say, you know, get a, get a bid quote on it through 20, through the year 2022. Yeah. Right, we can, we can buy this at $25 a ton through the year 2022. Well, it seems like this is definitely something we could talk about. So go ahead, Jeremy, and send me that, um, your estimate that, that you and Steve put together. That'd be great. And then I will share that with uh, Mark Habel, who I guess some of you know, right? We remember Mark and I went up in, in 2017. Not sure. When, when did you... When did you start work, Jeremy? 
when did I start work? Two and a half years ago. So this has been in the works for quite some time. And, you know, it's time to, I think, for the town to um, really decide what we want to do, figure it out um, with the Army Corps, figure out what the real costs will be to the town and what the benefits are. And then, yeah. um, and then, and then either let's get this done or not. I mean, we can't continue this. The Army Corps, I can't believe, is going to continue this on their work work plan for the northern New England for, you know, forever. So um, I, no. I'm sure Adam and the Corps wants to either get this done or, or move on to other projects. So this is what we'll do. We'll, um, I, I'll work with you, Jeremy, on, uh, you can send, send me that, that new, the revised uh, estimate. And then we will have a discussion with uh, Mark Hable and uh, Chris Hatfield from my office. And uh, just, we will discuss options about how can we use this cost estimate to justify that we feel confident that we will be getting bids that are, you know, in the ballpark of keeping us within a 107 study. Because obviously that's the easiest route is we just then sign an FCSA and move forward. I want to be sure though, uh, I want to be able to note, are we interested in an outer harbor protection and not an inner harbor protection? I think that yeah. we're, Correct. that's pretty much off the table, right? The inner harbor. Correct. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna pursue this at all, wouldn't we be looking at an outer harbor that would protect uh, the entire basin, like I showed before. I think that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think if we want to pursue this, if we want to keep pursuing this, we, we also would need to figure out what is the consensus um, of the people in Camden. You know, do they think this is a, a valuable thing to, to strive for, or um, because the last harbor committee literally voted to, to put this to bed and they thought it was, it was a, not a good idea for the community. Huh. Um, and then, yeah. and then we, we kind of reopened it because we weren't sure if that was the right, if that was the right, you know, idea to come up with. And that might not have been what the, the all the people collectively believe in. So I think we need to somehow have, get a tally, you know, paper, paper vote or something to figure out if this is a good idea to continue. Steve, was the negative opinion based on the three red outer breakwaters only, or did it include all the inner harbor stuff, which I don't see as very good? Uh, I think it was the basic idea of a, of a outer harbor breakwater. So it would, it would have been the, the bigger of the two that to actually make it so the whole outer harbor was protected. Uh, but again, I'm, I think it's, a, it's an amazing concept and we've been, you know, having this idea with the Army Corps since 19, since the 40s. So I think we should, we should come to the right decision and move forward either way. And I yeah, think because if the town, if the town will not, uh, if the town is ultimately not going to be coming up with the money and isn't even interested in general, then obviously we're, we're just spinning our wheels, right? Uh, right. And yes, it would be a significant, uh, this, this would be a, uh, a breakwater that would be visible. It's a large breakwater. It, you know, you have high, very, you know, you, your high tides, it would have to be built up so that at low tide, you'd have these, you know, really, really obvious breakwaters out in your harbor. <laughs> And on the other hand, you know, you'd have a, you'd have a pretty well protected harbor, right? I mean, that's the point of it, obviously. Right. Uh, I have a question for Adam. Yes. Uh, Adam, how uh, are sea level rise projections factored into the design? We would have to, we'd have to project uh, three different scenarios of sea level rise. Um, we have three different curves and one of them is pretty extreme. And right now the, we have 
it's pretty vague direction that we have. We are required to review the different, the three different scenarios and then decide which scenario we want to design for without really doing any kind of economic analysis because we don't know which has the most likelihood. And the scenario, the highest scenario would show about a three, I think about a three foot increase in, in sea level, let's say over the next hundred years. How many and years? That's quite a bit. And in the case of protecting the harbor, then we'd probably want to just, I think ultimately we would, we would build it high enough to be able to protect at least to some moderate sea level increase. We'd probably add another couple of feet to the. So that, that would yeah. impact the uh, stone volume estimates. Uh, I, 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 it's several years ago now, but the design I think already had a, quite a height to it. Um, let's see if I can find the, let's see if I can find this. Page 54, I see some information. 54. Yeah, right there, right where you were there. That, that's what I saw. Oh, right here. Yeah, it says design water level 15 feet, uh, which is where your high tide is now. Is that like a, is that a king tide or something? Probably. Yeah. Pretty high, tide, pretty high tide, yeah. I mean, that'd be a pretty significant tide right there, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, 15 feet above mean lower low water. And, uh, and then the structure crest would obviously be quite a bit higher than that. And I think that's where we'd build in our sea level rise. You know, the fact that this crest is significantly higher than the design water level. But I'm trying to see if uh, I did have it. Somewhere in here, I went way back into the air. Let's just see if I can. Reason I can't find the scroll. There it is. I'm just going to see what we came up with. With at least the we had a uh, right there. See if I can zoom in. Oh man, sorry about that. There. So it looks like it's somewhere around, uh, yeah, it says 17 feet here. Does it look right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look like 17, it looks like more like 18 or something. At any rate, um, well, I, I don't think that's obviously something we'd have to consider. These details. Tell. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's. What are our next steps here, Jeremy? Okay, the next steps are Jeremy and Steve and I will um, have to convince uh, my superiors that we're confident that we could get a, a reasonable estimate. And that would mean providing the, the estimate you have, Steve, to me, and then I will then share that, and then we'll have a conference call. And if we can convince folks, then we would then move ahead with this feasibility cost-sharing agreement executing a feasibility cost sharing agreement, which would mean that the town would have to sign an agreement where 
where they would cost share 50 50 for a feasibility study. And what's that estimated cost on the feasibility study? Six hundred, four to six hundred thousand. Yeah, four to six. I don't. I think I have seen. It depends on how much more uh, actual surveying had, has to be performed. I mean, if there's a lot of surveying costs, and that that adds up some more money, like eelgrass surveys and and additional surveys. But we, I thought we had a pretty decent survey that we already paid for out there as part of the original study. I, don't I have a question. But let's just say somewhere between four, four and 600,000. So that'd be around no more than a 300, two to $300,000 cost share that the town would have to come up with up front. Can I just ask, is the feasibility about the project as it's presented here? Because some of the chat from the schooner captains <clears throat> don't necessarily indicate that what's proposed is what they want. So does the feasibility include, as Steve alluded to, does the town actually want this or do we want elements of it, but not as presented? And does that then represent starting over, which I don't really wanna go there, but I'm just curious. Well, we would start over the, from the standpoint of we would really get, we would start developing deep, we'd start with what we have, but then we would reformulate and come up with very clear alternatives or measures that we combine to alternatives. And so these precise locations you know, we would really have a lot more precision at the, during the feasibility. That's why it's a little more expensive because right now we just kind of guessed where they would go. But if there's going to be a lot of discussion about, well, should we put one off of, you know, off of the the island, or should we put one, you know, on on these, um, well, not here, but uh, down here. That's good. You've answered the question. Yeah, I have a question. I have a question also. This is Bruce Peel. Um, currently, it seems like the harbor flushes itself pretty quickly from runoff pollution. I was wondering if these breakwaters will affect that and slow it down. Maybe it'll end up. We'll have to close Lake Beach more or do something like that. Is there any? Is that part of the study? I haven't. I haven't read the study. I'm sorry. I, during the feasibility study, we would definitely have to look at that. That would be additional analysis. And we haven't, we have not looked at the flushing capabilities of the harbor during this initial study. It just wasn't extensive enough. We were looking, we really focused in on, on wave energy and storm energy and surge. Mm -hmm. and the effects that it would have and what these potential uh, breakwaters would do to uh, reduce that energy. Are there, are there any time restrictions on this or deadlines we have to meet or for this project? Yeah, I think if we want to sign an FCSA, I would want to, I think, we would not extend this beyond this fiscal year. We would have to convince the, the various folks in the core that we can move ahead with this, uh, the 107 study and then sign this FCSA this fiscal year, which means before September, or I think we're out of luck and then you would then have to come up with the, your your match before September twenty twenty one. Yeah, um, a portion of it, probably the first hundred, maybe a hundred hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I'm I'm confused as to the fiscal year thing. Is it that we need to, and this is also a question to Mark Sigenthal. I assume the process is that at some point we would express an opinion to the select board. The select board would put it on an agenda, have a hearing or a you know, discussion with public input about whether to go forward with the feasibility study, which was the three or 400,000. And my question to Adam is, is the fiscal year 
time limit that we need to commit to that uh, feasibility study before September 2021, or that we literally need yeah. to have done all those things and we're ready to buy stone by September? No, we're not ready to buy stone. All we're doing is we'll have the FCSA signed and we will start the study. Okay. But yeah. I, I don't, I think study. that, uh, you know, I'm being uh, generous in terms of thinking that we could continue moving. I think it's on our agenda here. We haven't taken it off of our fiscal year 21 uh, program of work. So I think we have through September to get everything finalized, we should be signing the uh, execution of the feasibility cost share agreement, which means, I mean, obviously to get that done, the first step is to convince everyone that we have a study that we, we're fairly confident in, that the study will reveal a proposal that stays within the limits. You know, somewhere around so, $11 so million dollar total. Bob, just to clarify what, what you were stating there, I think it's, it's uh, Jeremy, Jeremy and Steve that would take it to the select board. And at some point, are we meant to express an opinion or why are we even talking about it? Yeah, we're, uh, yes, we're, we're supposed to evaluate it. And, you know, like, like Bob said before, we're not, we're not here to approve it or disapprove it. We're here to discuss it and express informed, uh, in, in, informed comments to the select board. Yeah, so they can make a decision. Yeah, because ultimately the select board, I imagine that the, the select board members uh, or the town administrator, probably the select board would be, or let's say, what? Do, how does the select board work? Is there a uh, chair? Yes. The board? Yeah, the chair probably would sign the agreement, but that would have to be voted on and approved and you'd have to have a, the ability to then, by September 21, allocate, let's say, uh, you'd have to commit um, that amount anyway, one fiscal year worth of money. For the feasibility study. Yeah, not for the project. feasibility study. Right. Because the way the agreement works is you commit year to year. You say that we are committed to the study, but you, uh, it's a, what is it called? A bilateral decision? Any, any party can, can close out at any time. So in other words, if we, both, if we all sign this and someone said, no, we're not gonna continue the study. Um, what you're agreeing to, at least when you sign it, is you would you'd want to, agree to giving us at least the fiscal year 22 money or whenever we start the study, like a year's worth of money. And, and we'd have to agree to that too. We'd have to commit to matching the amount of money and then and we'd get through as much of the study as we can in one year. I mean, I think from a town budget perspective, I mean, we're going to have to act pretty quickly on this, obviously. I mean, we're going to yes. have to included in the budget for next year. Um, you know, if we need to spend this for September of next year, so. Um, yeah, that would have to be in your budget item. We, you would have to show that or make a, make every effort to come up with somewhere around 100, $100,000. Yeah, so to, to, to sum up some of the key facts here, all right, number one, this project is still on the table. Number two, in order for the proper funding, it needs to be less than $10 million. Uh, probably 11 or 12. But... Okay, less than, less than $11 million. And uh, we need a select board approval to, to move forward on the feasibility study. Right. 
Blair? And we, and, and and we can't do anything until, uh, until Jeremy, Steve, and I can convince my superiors that, uh, that, we're, that we have good confidence that we can keep this under 11. Okay, let's do that. If we can, if we can do that, then, then I would say then immediately the town would have to then move forward and be sure that you're comfortable with signing the feasibility cost share agreement and coming up with the money. And if that means the town meeting or whatever, then that's what you have to get in your turn to. So let's, let's Jeremy, uh, Steve and I will then, that's our next hurdle. If we can't get through that, um, then your next option is to go through a general investigation study. And there's a, per, there's a method which I can send Jeremy a method uh, sometime in May in which you would put a request in for a general investigation. And then the, the process is that the core would add that to our list that we would provide to Congress. And then it would be up to Congress to add this study to the next Water Resources Development Act, WERDA. They would actually have to have this, uh, they don't have to add it specifically, but they would have to, it would have to be in what's called a work plan that's been presented by the Corps to Congress. Yeah, but the, and the, Congress the, signs a word uh, that includes enough money and says, we're gonna, we are gonna uh, appropriate money or authorize well, first of all, it's an authorization. So they would authorize the study. And late, the last word, they didn't authorize specific studies, but they authorized money to go towards the a studies that are on a list <laughs> that had been, uh, what's it called? There's been a... Uh, Adam, on those, in regarding those general investigation, um, in that word, uh, is there a cost share that's associated with that or no? Yeah, now that, the way that works is it's the same, the same way, but you'd, we'd have to, of course, wait to see whether or not right. you've okay. got on the work plan, number one, right. but the process that you would request it to be added to the work plan. Okay. And the core would put that work plan together and include Camden, let's say, let's just say, assume that. And then that would be then presented to Congress. And then when they sign the next WERDA, then that would provide authority to work that work plan. And then, and then at that point, uh, we'd have, we'd work under that authority, not under the Section 107 of right. Rivers and Harbors Act. And That's fair. That would be that specific authority, that WERDA, would be a WERDA 22 or something, right? 21. Right. 22. And then you would then sign a, a feasibility cost share agreement the same way, but under this new this new authority. That's all. And Understood. 50 50 cost, the same. The study would be a little more detailed because. We'd have Congress scrutiny. <laughs> it's not so. Mark thinks that the cost might go up a little bit for the study. So no, I'm, I'm I'm confused now. Is this is this the route we have to take, or is this the route so, only if we're over eleven million, Mark? So this is all superfluous. Let's work on the eleven million and yep. Yeah. Just telling you that if we don't make the eleven million. Then you would have to start another process that, yeah. where you'd have to get in your request by May. Okay, Adam, can you uh, uh, stop sharing your screen so we get our computers back? Yeah, definitely. I would also like to mention, I don't, um, you know, Kathy mentioned some comments that were uh, made, Barry, Barry had a, a comment and then Dominic chimed in after. I would assume these comments and part of this feasibility study, you guys would be taking into account those comments and concerns from 
you know, harbor users, et cetera, during this process, correct? Oh, absolutely. That would be part of the feasibility study. That'd be right. quite a bit, right. big component of it is getting, right. uh, well, we would do a more detailed economic analysis, first of all. I think we already showed justification to move ahead. I think, and, and yes, someone could maybe debate about did we, you know, should we have made a, obviously we did a cursory effort at looking at economic benefits. And maybe you could argue that they could have been higher or lower, but the, the results were that we did justify a project because it, you know, it was a decent two to one ratio. So even if we were off a little bit, with the benefits, we still felt confident that we had a project that, you know, worth studying. So the only thing that's that's stopping us at this point is this eleven million dollar threshold that they are now enforcing. That's all. Okay. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, then my follow up will be with you, Jeremy. Send me that cost estimate. And I'll set up a conference call or something like that with between you and Steve. I'll invite you, right? Yes, please. And and uh, it'll be with uh, Mark Hable, um, for sure. Okay. Well, uh, thank All you, right. everyone. And I know it's, it's a little bit complicated, but it's uh, it's where we are. <laughs> great. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, okay, Adam. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Enjoy the weather. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Okay, let's uh, move on now to uh, pick up our conversation about Windjammers and Day Sailor reviews and fees. Yeah, that's a. So, I guess I would like to to talk about the. Um, the, the day sailors, obviously the, the wind jammers, besides the mistress, um, you know, didn't actually run. I know that um, the wind jammers were, were asked um, and they, again, they responded to the select board about how appreciative they were that they were getting a break or some sort of break on their costs, you know, the yearly costs for the, to uh, keep the boats there. I don't know where that actually is right now what if the select board has actually decided, are they going to they, not they, charge them anything or, or charge them a percentage? I don't know where that is right now. They, they haven't decided, Steve. And at the last meeting, they asked us to um, discuss it. And yeah. Give, give them some sort of uh, uh, informed information to decide. Is this about 2020? 2020. Fees for the for the for the current yeah. year. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I have. Uh, you know, I guess I'll start with uh, with thoughts, and you know, I have kind of uh, mixed emotions on this. And I guess as Harbor Committee, we should say we should do everything we can to help promote these boats and. And, and give them all the benefits they, they can use. On the other hand, um, you know, as far as the wind jammers go, uh, they're, they're at the dock all summer and, and they take up space. And, and, you know, everybody, everybody I know of that, that ties up to a dock and has the convenience of a dock has to pay for it. You don't just say, well, you know what, we're just going to like let you tie up here for free. And, um, you know, that's just a general cost of ownership. Um, so, you know, and I understand they're not, you know, they're not operating their business, but, you know, most boat owners don't have businesses and they still pay for their dockage. So it's kind of, 
I don't know which way. I I I I go either way on this. Tell you the truth, and Mark. Uh, yes, I gotta respond. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Most people who own boats do so as a discretionary cost. If they choose to be from wherever and buy a $250,000 Hinkley picnic boat and operate that as a private vessel uh, and they have the the wherewithal to do all that, that's a little bit of a, that's a horse of a little bit of a different color than someone who is, you know, to compare that to someone who's trying to operate a business. Well, it, Barry, that's not for what you, I'm for you, to, for you to bring those two up in the same sentence is, wow, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. I'm just gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute out on that. Sorry, sorry, Barry, you interpret it that way, but that was not the way it was meant to be interpreted. And uh, I'm talking about boat owners in general. All right. How about, how about the wind jammers in Rockland? What are they doing? Yeah. What, what do, uh, you want to refer to business owners, all right? What about business owners um, that, that rent their space? All right. Have they stopped paying their rent? And not open, they're still paying their rent. Yeah, that that's fine. I, I don't. As I as we said in our letter, we will do whatever is in the best interest of the town. We were not the ones who proposed putting off payments. That was on. That that was what the select board came up with. We we never asked for that. We didn't ask for federal grant money. We didn't ask for. COVID, we didn't ask for any of this. So, you know, there are, you know, if I could change the name of my business to American Airlines, I'd be all set. But that, so that's, not, that's not the situation. So, so my situation is, and I think that I, you know, I, I'm not gonna speak for anyone else, but our situation is what was that due to circumstances well beyond our control, you know, as hard as we tried to influence the environment under which we were able to operate this year, working with uh, the state to craft guidelines under which overnight passenger vessels could operate. And I was, I was deeply involved in that process as were uh, a number of the other windjammer owners in the Harbor, um, you know, things were beyond our control. So, so again, we are, we are delighted that the select board would, would have taken the initiative to say, hey, let, let's hold up and, and see if there's anything we can do for the wind jammers. And I believe I'm, I'm not misstating that. Um, that. That was welcome on our behalf. And we were asked to chime in and we said, Hey, you know, whatever's best for the town. And if that means, if that means, you know, paying the full fare, that's fine. You know, it, if, if that much money is going to make or break me, uh, I'm in really desperate straits. I mean, I'll borrow the money. So, you know, it's not a big deal. Again, the, the town started this conversation, not the windjammer owners. Mark, I, I just, as a sort of point of order question, why are we having this discussion? I, I didn't think that we were supposed to be debating for the select board whether or not to um, be waiving or, or um, working with the fees for the wind jammers. I, I thought this discussion was about the day sailor reviews and perhaps the wind jammer reviews. And it would seem that the wind jammer reviews are quite simple in that all except for one didn't run. So th those are pretty easy reviews. Um, and, uh, and then we can turn to the day sale reviews where they most mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I mean, why are we debating something that the select board is going to be uh, determining? I, I don't really see as this is our, our role. Because- yeah. Can I just add to that before you answer, Mark? Um, because what I was gonna propose was that, yeah, we don't drill down into this too much either, other than my recommendation or my question is, is part of our decision to 
roll the three years now, skipping 220, and just roll it over for another three years in the hope that they are sailing next summer, um, and then let the select board decide what they're charging. And I would hope they would be very gentle. I have a question or two. Uh, it, do the day say, do the wind jammers or day say, well, do the wind jammers it's essentially pay a separate winter storage fee or do they have an annual fee that includes the winter storage all in one dollar yeah. fee? Yeah, just, just all in one fee. And then the second question is, uh, in terms of wear and tear on the floats, which I think there would be some increased wear and tear if you're tied up to them every day all summer going up and down versus uh, being out on the water. But uh, is that something that the town just picks up out of its budget or do they have some obligation to maintain the actual space they're stored in? Yeah, no, that's, that's the town, that's town owned, town owned property. So the, the town is, is in charge of, you know, of that. There's not, there's not, there's minimal wear and tear in the docks because they have their own, you know, lines that that keep them fast to the uh, to the moorings. Right. So there's, it's not like they, the floats or the equipment has to be replaced every few years. It's it's a very slow grind on on any wear and tear. Y yeah. Correct. You know, the, the, uh, the discussion, I think, would be like, like Kathy said, you know, this we're in a pandemic. The select board already has you know, said, hey, we should probably give them a break. You guys could just come up with a, someone can come up and say, well, you know, the, the, the day sailors ran at 75 percent or, or whatever. I'm sure a day sailor will, can come in and say, we basically ran at this percentage. So the town could charge the day sailors, you know, possibly that percentage where the wind jammer is, you know, operated at pretty much 0%. So you could say, they could say, you could, you're basically just trying to help the select board figure out what's fair. You know, let's, let's, let's charge the, the day sailors half what we usually do and the wind jammers nothing for this year because of the pandemic or something along those lines. So I'm could just quick discussion and then a couple of opinions. I do just want to query that one con one one schooner owner didn't sign and then still sailed. And I, I think that's not good practice. And I think we need to discuss that. Is is there just an acceptance that they he they will sign it and get a rolling agreement for next time with no penalty? I mean that, that makes a kind of a mockery of our process of having agreements. Yeah, well, we'll both uh, Liz and I are, are going to be having a conversation with Ray and figure out what happened, who dropped what ball and what exactly happened there and to make sure that doesn't happen again. I mean, hopefully we won't be in this situation next year, but you never know. So, yeah, we're on top of that. Okay. I, I propose for the active day sailor operators, those that operated in 2020, that they be, they have a prorated fee. And I don't have a formula for what, uh, how to prorate that. Uh, for the, uh, uh, those that did not operate, such as the Lazy Jack, then there would be no fee. And their licensing would be deferred for the, until next year. Um, for the, the mistress, Kathy just brought up a good point. I think that the wind jammers should be responsible for some kind of dockage fee. That, that's something they're getting. And I, I don't have a formula for that either. Uh, as far as the, the one day sailor that did not operate, I'm questioning what the status of their license is. Or yeah, what I can, right I can speak to that. Sean, um, you're referring to the Lazy Jack. He did come in and sign his license. Um, he did have an agreement that he was not going to run this year. All the day sailors have paid their first half 
with the exception of Jeff Beck. He um, put the boat in the water August 10th, signed his uh, license or his agreement. And I don't know where the payment for um, Jeff lies, but the other day sailors have paid half, their first half of their agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm fine with that, with Lace Jack. Did not pay anything, right? Right. He came to us very early March or April and said he just couldn't uh, couldn't do it. Um, so there, and he went straight to Audra um, mm -hmm. and said that he wouldn't be running. But he yeah, did sign yeah. his agreement to hold his his permit or his license. Okay. Then what about Sally? Um, there was no communication um, after March through um, Ray's office. I have nothing, no payment, no signed agreement. I never heard from, that's what Steve was, we'll get in touch with Ray and see what's going on there. Okay. So does that mean they for, uh, Sally forfeits the license, their right to the license? I think that's part of the discussion that we're going to have, or oh. we all need to have as well oh. as a right, committee. So and the, the, the prorated fees paid by the day sailors, is that considered a done deal by everybody? I don't think, I believe so, but I can't speak for sure. Um, I know that they all were asked or they all came in out of good faith and paid that first half. What that means going forward, I think that's another part of this, this, this discussion that we need to decide on. Yeah. Exactly. It's in the conversation. The, the, yeah. The terminology that was used here is uh, the payments were delayed. Collection of the payments were delayed. All right. And the select board is in the process of reviewing how to handle that, how much to charge, how much not to charge. So, so that's a select board decision ultimately. Yes, it is. Were there other businesses in town that were granted the same? No. Are there other businesses that rent from the town? Well, we have other businesses licensed by the town. Restaurants, bars, hotels, etc. Were there similar arrangements made for those different businesses? No. no. I may be mistaken, but I believe that um, one of the businesses that rents space out of the snowball um, was given a different rate because they were not open this summer um, when they normally would have been. Um, so that's an example of a situation in which the, the town as a, I, I don't know what you want to describe it lease or licensee, li licensor, um, recognized that a business uh, was not gonna be fully operational and, uh, and, and negotiated a different rate. And you can check with Beth um, on that, but I'm pretty sure that's true. Yeah, I, I recall re reading that also, Barry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that, I think that's good that the town is willing to exercise flexibility given the extreme circumstances that we're all operating. Um, so, so, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're talking about boats that, that are operating under town licenses, but then there are boats that are, that are operating off of private docks. And uh, so, in preparing for this, I, I just contacted them to see what what alterations they made. And um, for instance, Appledore paid paid full fare. They operated all year, and uh, their numbers were very close to uh, any other regular year. So, you know that should fall into part of the decision making too. It's like, you know, other boats operated. Uh, I, 
Steve, can I ask about Appledore? Because I must admit, watching boats come and go, every time I saw them go by full, I remember thinking, how the hell are they doing that and abiding by any of the mandates? Because there were a lot of people on those boats. It, yeah. So, but, I mean, who's monitoring right? that? You know what I mean? And so, of course, all of our boats could have gone out if nobody's, for the Coast Guard's not out there arresting people because they're breaking the state protocols. I mean, I don't know how they got people to, to, to do that, but um, I don't yeah, think we should be applauding them for running a business that put people at risk. Um, but I was told is they operate at 50% capacity. And in, in compensating for that, they raised their fee and told ticket holders that, you know, based on COVID, um, this is why you're paying more. And that didn't seem to be a problem. I'm not sure I would compare the day sailor model to the overnight passenger vessel model. I don't, I don't believe that's an apples and apples comparison. Absolutely correct. I think um, what I know of the two overnight passenger vessels that went out of Rockland. Um, uh, I don't believe those vessels, uh, if they broke even on the season, that would be a stretch. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, um, their choice, their choice, their business choice to, to go ahead and operate um, this is the first time I listen to these guys anyway. Was, you, you know, it is debatable from a financial point of view. And I believe that our, our, as Kathy pointed out, our, I think for at least for those people who I've talked to in Camden, our choice to operate um, or not operate was based on, um, uh, fin uh, excuse me, not financial considerations, but public health considerations. Given what we knew, at the moment that we had to make that decision. Good point, Barry. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, does someone have a motion yet? Is someone, someone gonna make a? Well, I, I don't, don't think we really do a motion on this. What, what we're, the select board is looking for opinions and facts to base their decision on. Okay, so. One, one fact, which I'd like to document for the select board is just what Barry said, all right? They, they made their decision based on public health, all right? I think that's an important fact. Um, I think the other fact is that, you know, the boats operating off of private docks did not receive a break in their fees. So, you know, I mean, we're not trying to make a decision here. We're trying to present the facts for the select board to make their decision. I'd like to ask I'd like Barry. To ask Barry. Barry, a question. Barry, a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Barry, I heard your earlier statement. Um, but I want to ask again, do you think that uh, uh, some type of dockage fee for the 2020 season for the wind jammers is fair? Um, I think... Boy, I've learned a lot in the last few uh, few months watching politicians. I think what's important to focus on <laughs> is um, what is in the best interest of the town of Camden. Um, and I, again, we were offered this opportunity. Uh, I am fine paying myself. And I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not speaking for everybody, but you know, if, if I pay the full thing, that's fine. If I pay half the thing, you know, half the rate, 
that's fine. If we, you know, I, I'm fine with whatever the town mothers, fathers, select board committees think is in the best interest of the town. It's not about, again, it's not about, um, you know, we're not asking for anything. We're, we were just asked our opinion. And so, yeah, did, I, did, did we go backwards financially um, this year? You're darn right we did. Um, you know, it, it, it cost over $120,000 to get a schooner ready to go sailing. Eighty percent, uh, excuse me, uh, close to eighty thousand dollars of that was refunded back to people who decided not to come sailing with us. A number of people, most of our returning guests, which is which is a large proportion, decided to carry their their deposits towards next year, which means that's revenue we won't be receiving next year to operate. So there's so there's lots of nuances here, but again, the point is to drive it back home, I'll pay whatever the town thinks, um, you know, wants. It's not, again, it was not our, it was not our request. And if it's the whole thing, that, that's the whole thing. It's, it's fine. Um, we're not asking for anything for free. We're not asking for special treatment. You know, the select board brought it up as a, as a, um, you know, an idea to support um, an industry that is an icon of the community. And, you know, and we greatly appreciate that. So yeah, I, I would be glad to, to pay whatever, whatever anyone wants up to the agreed upon amount. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, Elliot, Mark, I, I steered, I steered way around your question, Elliot, but, but that's, um, you know, I think that's, that's the, that's where I'm thinking. Sorry, Mark, this is Ramiro. Can I have a word, please? Sure, go ahead. Yes, um, hi, everybody. Um, just uh, a quick comment about uh, boats that run out of um, a private docks. Uh, we do have Enjiga that runs out of um, one of Stuart Smith's um, docks, which is the same system as Ablador has, a dock system. And uh, we did have a break on our, um, on our lease uh, there. So just to everybody to know that um, we had to pay some, of course, but uh, we had a break. And, and I think also the, I want to make sure that everybody knows that um, Appleter, I think, uh, didn't run at 50% capacity. Um, that boat is a 49 passenger vessel. And um, there was times where they run more passengers than 25. So, um, and their rate were the same of uh, the years before. And I don't believe they uh, made the same amount of revenue that years before. Um, we all talk and I'm not 100% about this, but uh, this is what I think. And, and we, I don't think none of the day sailors uh, match years past. So we, we did have some revenue, of course, but um, not at the same level of years before. Um, and just to, um, uh, we need to, before this conversation about the sailors uh, finish, um, we want to make sure that um, the Harbor Committee uh, kind of makes a recommendation to the select board about how they're going to um, uh, decide uh, that uh, the permit that is actually uh, the seventh permit uh, that apparently great holds, but they don't know if this holds or not because he didn't. Uh, um, so we really don't know if Ray still holds it. And uh, there is more, there is actually, as, 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 as far as my knowledge is, there's two boats that actually apply for that permit and, uh, and see how the, the town or the select board is going to decide who, uh, you know, what boat they're going to you know, give it to it. Um, so I just want to make sure that they talk about this before the end of the, 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 before the, the, end of the meeting. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Romero. That's that's our next topic. Right. Thank you, Romero. So 
Do we have any other points of recommendation for fees for the select board? Bob, you're muted. I don't think you can uh, get the slide ruled out on this question. And right. I had the first reaction when I read Steve's reports about people had paid half of their fee. And my first gut instinct was, well, that seems appropriate. It's just shared. You know, there's no, who gets, whether American Airlines gets something or someone else, it's just a complete mess of how to deal with this. And my instinct is that we should just recommend that, you know, for this year and this year only, that the 50% makes gut instinct sense. I would only add to that, Mark, that I think um, there does need to be a distinction made between the day sailors and the wind jammers in our recommendations. And I think 50% for the day sailors may be appropriate, but 50% uh, for the wind jammers, which all but one um, chose, chose not to run or essentially were not allowed to run. Um, I think that needs to be looked at separately. I'm not sure I would agree with uh, 50%. I, I I did I was only addressing the day sailors and I agree with you. Okay. Any other suggestions for the select board? I think we've probably covered it there. Uh so the next question is still day sailors. Um, and it's what happens when licenses uh, are not renewed and there become openings. Are we comfortable with seven licenses? Uh, have we determined that seven licenses are too many? Um, have we determined second votes or maybe too many? Um, you want more second votes and yeah. with all I, that let's discuss I personally think at 1020 that this was probably a subject if it started at 835 we would have devoted much of a meeting to and I, I don't sort of like to do something that's pretty serious sort of as a postscript and I'm wondering whether either the next meeting or just the I mean, Zoom's pretty easy to pull together, whether we just address this soon at a separate time. Seconded. <laughs> and what time would you propose? Doesn't matter to me, I'm retired. Same time next week. Like th this is a really full agenda and full agenda. we need to- Jeremy. Jeremy, go ahead. I just want to say you can try to schedule those meetings, but Janice has to be Janice has to okay that the time works and that um, you know we can do Zoom at that time. So because it may work for you all, it does not necessarily mean it, it works for the town of Camden in setting up a Zoom meeting. So I guess I would schedule a time and then you that's tentative until Janice says okay, we can do a Zoom meeting on that day. Thank you, Jerry. Janice, can you hear Janice. us? Uh, Mark, may I have a word again, please? This is Ramiro. Uh, uh, go ahead, Ramiro. Um, so there is a deadline on November 15 to present uh, uh, applications for uh, day, for day sale applications. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an important matter. And we've been waiting for mm -hmm. over a month for the uh, Harbor Committee to make a decision on this. And I think it's... Um, it just postpone this for another meeting. It, it's keep waiting for this. So um, I urge the Harbor Committee to keep talking about this. Thank you. What What's your deadline to submit what applications? I thought people had three year agreements. Right. Yeah, I think that's correct. That, well, yeah, okay, but uh, we haven't the, the the Harbor Committee or the Select Board haven't uh, confirmed if. Ray Williamson still have that seven permit. If he has a three year permit or he doesn't have a three year permit or if that seven permit is for grabs or not. So that's what that's what, what um, nobody, nobody has a, a chance to explain yet. Perry Winkle. Yeah. So that's the deadline he's talking about, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
But there's only seven. So, there's only seven. There's two, there's two yeah. applicants. As far as I know, there's two applicants for that uh, seven permit. But nobody has to, nobody Let explained say, yet yeah. or, or decided whether that seven permit is up to grabs or not because uh, Ray Williamson's applied for the 2020 <laughs> and he didn't use it and he didn't um, uh, he presented the they sign agreement to the town. So um, we don't know if that seven permit is, uh, is available or not. Does that make sense, Mark? I have two permits, that um, two applications that were sent in for, um, for two new boats. So that's the decision Ramiro is asking to be made. Is that seventh permit available for those two applications? But I don't understand this, de this magic moment of November 15 versus, you know, a week later or a month later. Yeah. That's just the deadline on the application. I mean, they can certainly make an application. And, and what we're not deciding whether to accept the boat here or not accept the boat. What we're supposed to discuss is how we feel about or how we, if a license did become available, how would we make a determination of who would get it? Or... Do we want to reduce the number of licenses altogether? Well, but I, but I think I think it's a very. It's, I mean, businesses has to plan ahead of what to do, and I think it's an important it's an important issue uh, right now to see whether you know there is going to be a seventh permit or not, or that if that seventh permit is available or not. From yeah, there. that's a good that's a good point. It's a good point that Ramiro makes up. I, um, whether or not Ray Williamson has a permit, I, I mean, he's in, right now in a three-year uh, agreement. Uh, unsigned. Well, be, be, besides the fact it's unsigned, so that's, that's the thing that. That's a big fact. Yeah, well, then, then you guys can you guys can make a recommendation to the select board that because there's not a signed agreement right now, that it is up for grabs. But it's up to you guys to decide that. It's a little odd that it's um, that he didn't sign that. No, it's. Uh, yeah, I, no, it's not. I, I don't think it is up to us to decide that. I think it's up to uh, the town powers to be and the attorneys, town attorneys. No, 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 Mark, what I meant was it's up to you right now to decide if you want to have this discussion, someone make a, a, a formal, you know, uh, motion, say you guys vote that the select board do something about the fact that there's an unsigned, uh, you know, a, agreement right now. I. I, I don't have a problem with the Harbor Committee. I'll make a motion that the Harbor Committee recommend to the select board that they determine whether uh, Ray Williamson and Sally has a valid ex currently existing agreement, period. That's the, the first motion because when they determine that if they say, yes, he does, well, Everything else that we would be wasting time on is a waste of time. And if they say, I, we consider that there, that that is not an existing agreement or we're not signing it a year after or at the end of the season, however you want to put it, then they, they would be asking us what Bob Fasciani asked us. Do, you, do we recommend that they fill that spot? And if so, how? Or that we think there's an overburden and we're glad to reduce the number and not take any, but it's not a, uh, everything has to be decided today. This very first question is, is there even an opening? Because if they say no opening, uh, we don't have a discussion. Well, well we, you, you see, I, and that's exactly what we wanted to avoid. And that's why the select board is, is asking us before there is an opening, how would we proceed if a boat came in. So but this me, that, that's, that is blurring the line. You know, Ray oh, Williamson's question is, uh, should be looked at by itself. Does yeah. he have an agreement or not? Yes. Okay. Well, right, also, so, because, one, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. That's it. That's okay. There's, so there's a motion on the table here that Bob just made asking the select board to, um, review and make a determination of whether or not Ray Williamson has a valid uh, current license for Sally. I'd like to second that motion. 
Aye. <laughs> motion, motion made and seconded. All in favor? No, Raise I, your hand. No discussion. Yeah. Oh, any more? You any, might want to discuss. No. Further discussion? Now, now take in favor? A favor. Unanimous. The, the other reason I don't want to just have a uh, discussion on, so what do we, if they say no Ray, there is possibly a seventh opening. I, I haven't looked at the ordinance. I have no idea what the existing rules are when someone applies. I have a gut feeling that if we were to say, no, we're reducing the number of uh, applications uh, that we would really be re recommending that an ordinance change be made I uh, because I don't know if the ordinance says how many can be accepted or not mm -hmm. uh, and the frankly, if if there is a uh, maybe the ordinance never thought that gosh there could be newcomers <laughs> because you'd think that the ordinance would have some standards for granting an application to someone uh, and I want to have a chance to look at that before we waste our breath making recommendations that uh, are, you know, uninformed by, by the ordinance. I just want to say one more thing, if I have, if I have a chance. <laughs> In the last uh, select board meeting, uh, they talk about the sailors and the permits, and they recommended, and I think this is why Steve did it, uh, to have uh, all of the reviews for all of the day sailors and see how they did in the year 2020. Uh, and that was asked for the select board. And one of the reasons that this come up is because um, it, when the select board, uh, when Ray um, applied for that, it, it was, um, it was uh, something that this Harbor Committee actually uh, recommended is that he needed to run on the year uh, 2020. And, um, and, and everybody knows that he's been applying for that permit um, for the last uh, three years and not using it. So this is the fourth year that Ray Williams has applied for this permit and not using it. So I just want to make sure that the, the Haru committee remembers that, that it's, it's been four years on the road that it's been applied and not used. Thank you. And I think that's what the select board should take into account one way or the other. So what was Bob, to address your question about the uh, Harbor Ordinance, yeah. this is what it says. The select board shall not accept or grant leases or rental agreements in excess of seven such leases or rental agreements. Okay. The owners of, of seven, seven separate day sellers. So, and would Ray represent number seven or... Yes. So yeah. it's up to seven. So the select board has the ability to say, you know what? We kind of liked it this year with only five boats running and it made it comfortable. We want to reduce it to five. Or, you know, it was, it was nice with seven boats and let's keep it at that. I'm not entirely sure whether Bill Kelly would agree with that interpretation. Why is that? Because what it's saying is not an, it, you can have not an excess of right. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that if so that if you have six, you rule on six. But if you have eight, you can only grant seven. Uh, I'm not sure that they can artificially say that uh, the seventh application, even though it's really beautiful, is going to be rejected because we want to reduce the, the number that are out there. I'm yes, not they can. I'm, yes, they can. Yes, they can, and they do that for many years. Okay. So that that is the direction this discussion is supposed to go in. It's um, <laughs> you know, and the other thing is, if if okay, we decide okay, if if a boat does a slot does become available, then we have two or more boats applying for that same slot, what is the criteria that we use to determine who gets it? 
that's where I'd say an ordinance would be making that call. Otherwise, you've got a, a, a legal problem. Well, section C here, uh, section three, item C, criteria for application approval. Yeah. What kind of factors? Well, it's a paragraph. Uh, shall I read it? I'd be interested. In September of each year, select board will make a decision whether to lease or rent any of the commercial passenger vessel float space or berthing slips which are available and vacant. And in the event of such an election, the select board shall cause a request for proposals for rental of use to be published in a newspaper of general circulation no later than October 15th of each year. The notice shall indicate that proposal shall be submitted in writing to the town manager shall contain such reasonable information as requested by the select board no later than November 15th. Lease agreements or rental agreements with such, with such provisions as the select board choose shall be nego negotiated and such written agreements fully signed and submitted to the town office no later than December 30th of the year in advance of the first season of proposed use. And the, and the board does do that. Okay. So I, I believe maybe the question was, how do you choose between two boats? Right. Have, have they published in the paper and given public notice that there's space available? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unknown by me. Janice? They just vote every September whether they're going to rent or lease the spots. I don't know about the advertising for the boats. They don't typically do that part. That's on the Harbor Committee, I believe. Okay. Here further, and really you need to go in and read this for yourselves. The Harbor Committee will make recommendations about day sailor licenses and windjammer berths based on the characteristics of the vessels. And again, the Harbor Committee will make recommendations. Characteristics of the vessels and the ability of the public landing facility to accommodate the vessel's operations, such as parking number of passengers, navigation, use of day sailor float and other pertinent considerations. The uh, select board may, among other things, consider current uses of, and users of the facility for which the application applies. Uh, preference will be given to current day sailor owners who have abided by the ordinance, the size of the vessel, the number of passengers, availability and effect on parking, availability of and need for public utilities, access to the facility by the vessel. So the select board may consider the Harbor Committee recommendations for permits. So hearing that, I think that there's the initial question is, is there any reason, and I'd be asking Steve for an opinion about this, is there any reason to limit the number of vessels? Are we actually having an overburden? And then secondly, it's, it seems to me that the ordinance has laid out a lot of things to be considered uh, and that maybe our recommendation comes when particular applications are there that we can make a recommendation that we like A instead of B because of whatever, but the criteria that we're meant to be thinking about are actually already laid out there. That's right, Bob. And I think, uh, and Elliot, thank you for pointing that out. I think that is the exact paragraph the select board is looking for to make informed decisions. And that's, I, I think that they were asking us to recreate that paragraph in essence. So it's, it's already there. And I think some of it is uh, flavor, shall we say. So let's just be absurd. One of the applicants is trying to put a cigarette boat there. And the other one is trying to put a classic sco small schooner there. And you might be able to say, well, within the context of Camden Harbor, one fits the vibe and one doesn't, but that's based on 
you know, the actual application, you know, the general criteria that an applicant is meant to address in their application are all set forth right there. Absolutely. And that that's correct. And, and, but, and, and to take it one step further, if you've got two, two similar classic traditional boats and one boat says, Hey, you know what? I don't need parking. You know, then that's that's something else that you weigh in on and say, well, you know what? The, the, this boat wants parking. This boat doesn't. We take him. Yeah, and it also it also um, merits something that is the the two other permits that have been requested have uh, have been come to me and said, well, you know, Steve, I don't know if the select board would ever consider this, but. We we could run these two boats, um, to, you know, and share that share that slip because we don't need that much time on the dock. So there's a lot of different things to discuss and to talk about. A uh, the the most important thing is does does the Sally currently have a, a an agreement with the town? Is that is that good? Even though it was never signed. Uh, once you figure that out, um, you know, then you figure out okay. So now we have two applications that are going for the seventh uh, spot. For 2021, does the select board feel it, uh, you know, necessary to have seven permits uh, like they did this year? If that's the case, then we have to just discuss, well, which of the two are we going to select? Or is there a way we could work it out so they could, they could both run without too much so I, traffic? I have a question you, Steve. Do you see a problem with having seven licensees? No. And then I think we could, if the board agrees, we could include that in a motion that we do not see a problem with seven. And then the last thing to me would be, I think that they ought to get their applications in there. And if they really think that they want our opinion about the two competing applications, they can ask us and refer those applications to us for review. Gosh. Uh, I just, yeah, I just want to follow up on that question, Bob, and, and put it to you, Steve. Do you uh, see a problem with seven day sailors operating similar types of trips? So by that, I mean the two or three hour trips that most of the day sailors run. Do you see uh, foresee a problem of seven vessels? We've never had that in Camden. We've never had seven vessels running, you know, two or three rotation off of that dock. Um, do you think that dock can handle you know, as far as the schedule is concerned, we have had seven operating. Um, the Sally is on the schedule, you know, so it's it's blotted out that she gets to be there for 15 minutes to drop, you know, load passengers, drop us. Um, it's never really she just ne she's never physically done it. But as far yeah. as the schedule the schedule lo looks, it's totally doable. Well, we've never actually seen it. We, we, it looks, it works on paper, but we don't actually know that it works yet. Yeah, yeah. And if it works on paper, it's going to work in real life. <laughs> it just means that, you know, the uh, the boat that usually stays there an extra 15 minutes after they dock it's so they can enjoy their coffee, they can't do that anymore. And that's mm -hmm. fine with the town. And it's probably, it's going to be fine with the the, the permits, as, permit holders as well. They realize that they've had it easy the last, you know, so many years. Um, and they realize, you know, by looking at, they, they know the schedule better than anybody. As soon as we say, here's what's going to happen, they know already, oh, that means I can't take that extra 10 minutes. I've got to get that boat off that dock ASAP. And I'm sure they're willing to do, to do that. It's Taking just the fact it's a little more discipline on their part. So that's on the dock. If you add in um, another commercial vessel operating, as I said, on the two hours, you're also putting that vessel into the Federal Navigable Waterway, the Inner Harbor and Outer Harbor. Do you feel that that can also um, accommodate it without impacting any other users in the harbor? Yes, because you're just talking about one more boat. Okay. You see, Josh, I mean, that's an interesting point you bring up because, um, you know, boats can operate from any other dock in, in the harbor and impact uh, the waterways of the harbor. Um, and I'm, 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 you know, I, so I think the question is, does, does the Camden owned waterfront, can that accommodate the seven boats? Um, you know, for Lyman Morris, I mean, for example, I mean, what if, 
what if a couple boats ran off the Lyman Morris dock? And they could certainly do that. Wouldn't wouldn't need a permit. Wouldn't what ifs. Okay. Just would need you're okay. How does he do that? So, it kind of changes the subject. Did that change the subject? Well, it, it changed the subject a, a little bit. The applications for those two boats are. Ramiro, the reception is terrible. A little bit. Can't hear a word you're saying, Ramiro. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, want, I wanted to say that the, um, the, the two applications, that, so if you guys want to review those applications, uh, they are in the town. They are, they are the... We're not comprehending what you're saying, Romero. So on the road, um, I'm, what I'm trying to say is the applications for those two days uh, there are in there for review. Yeah, Romero, we're not getting anything you're saying, so. I think he's saying there's applications in there, but we wouldn't be, in my opinion, we don't review the specific applications until uh, the select board has determined that there's an opening, they're accepting applications because, and that is one question I think we can, if we agree, that seven is okay, we can make a recommendation that they continue to award seven permits. I yeah. uh, And then that's when we would beg off by saying, your criteria are already laid out there. And if you want our recommendation about any particular applicant, ask us after you've reviewed it. Uh, Mark, do you think that you have enough to take to the select board responding regarding? I, I think I do. Um, I think I do, yes. And, 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 and have we made a decision on Sally? for a recommendation we don't make a decision we've asked the select board to make a recommend make a determination okay All right. so and, and have we made a recommendation on fees for the day sailors that operated um we haven't made a recommendation but we have we have uh, determine several um, discussion points for them to review. Okay, and say likewise for the wind jammers? One, one, one would be the fact that they, they are still using the docks. The other is uh, the decision for the, um, the uh, wind jammers was based on public health benefits and um, um, the other is uh, private boat dockage. The Apple Door didn't receive any discounts or breaks in their dockage fee. However, Angica did. And um, everybody seemed to feel that a 50% fee was, was doable and comfortable for everybody. For the day sailors for the day sailors. That operated. Well, yeah, but so, so we, we don't think that pertains to the wind jammers? No. What, what do you think about the wind jammer fees then? Well, I think the wind jammers were shut down, period. Just, and I think that's a situation. De deferred for 2020. 
is my opinion, and with some consideration for dockage. Drew a distinction between the windjammers and the day sailors by the mode of operation that they do. The windjammers weren't able to meet the protocol and operate. The day sailors were. And there was some personal discretion of the operators as to whether or not they required masks. And they should have, but most of them didn't. I saw a lot of day sailors going out and the majority of the people on board didn't wear masks. So the people that did follow protocol deserve some reward for that effort, I think. Good point. I will just say report. that I saw, yeah, sorry. For not following the protocol. That's just really bad practice. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, I, and I think the, I think the select board is clever enough to see that, but they may not be aware of the circumstances with regard to the actual operation or lack of operation. Camden Town Office, Matthew. Can I just say, Ron, I did see a lot of the crew generally always wearing masks. It was the passengers and th that would be hard to control. But I always felt very, very sorry when I saw them out in the outer harbor <laughs> with masks on. But God bless them, they did it. So I think we have to honor that our crew and our operators did the best that they could. Um, As the season went on, I did notice that change in the beginning. There was a lot of crew without masks. So, All right. So, I'm, what what we're trying to determine here is the the wind jammers with the recommendation for the wind jammer fees. Well, just as a frame of reference, there's there are businesses not just locally but nationwide that have granted uh, furloughs or or, or granted uh, exceptions to rent payment in order to uh, make sure that their tenants. Um, stayed in business and were able to uh, realize some some income. So th there's no there's no hard and fast rule here. Obviously, it's a it's a discretionary thing. But uh, I I would be embarrassed if Camden didn't make the effort to uh, reward the windjammers for having followed protocol. Steve, how many trips did Mistress make? Uh, she made o o over six, over six trips. I don't know if you have the exact count, but she was doing five day trips. Yeah. Uh, so how do you make a distinction there? You know, it's, it's whether you run or not, you're still using the space. I, I don't know. I mean, that's a dilemma. Do you, do you like penalize them and charge them more because they actually did run? Because we're really not supposed to be in the business running these boats. We're supposed to be offering the the space for the business to operate in. So right, that suggests that suggests that there's a that, that there's a windjammer waiting in the outer harbor to come in and take the Mary Day space. If, if no, 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 no. If Steve no. doesn't operate. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's a decision based on principle. It's it's not based on on finance. It's an ethical decision. Right. My my point is though that we don't we don't say well because because the mistress ran we charge them more than than the other wind jammers. Mark, I would suggest that they didn't run a full season. Right. They were only able to run because they could meet the protocol. Everyone else didn't run because they couldn't meet the protocol. But we got to go back to the first stop, which is Ray did not sign. So even though he was working, he was working without his permit and he didn't pay anything, is my understanding, if he didn't sign. So those are so you got the, you know, I, I think the town needs to honor and um, do the best for the, the schooners and give them some kind of absolute discount, but we deal, still need to deal with the Williamson issue. How does he, is he the mistress? Oh, 
Does do we do we know if he has a license agreement, a valid license agreement for mistress? We know about Sally that that there's some question about that, but is is there a license agreement for mistress? Oh, no, Josh, I, I I think Steve said that all the wind jammers, uh, none of the wind jammers actually signed their license agreements. The oh, town never sent them out. So it's not it's not that the the wind jammers defaulted on their agreement. It's the town never sent them out. Then yeah, exactly. We were the pandemic was there. The pandemic was upon us, and the town wasn't sure what to do. I mean, luckily for Ray, the wind the, the mistress only holds six people, so he was able to take families of five or four and uh, and still be able to run. But then, Steve, quite frankly, I think it falls to you to have said you cannot proceed until you actually go through, you know, yet the town didn't sign it. I just think there's, we can't, you can't just sit back and go, oh, well, he, he can do it. Let's let him. No, no, you're, you're absolutely that's right. That's, that's why we're, that's why we're in the process of setting up a, a meeting with Ray Good. to figure out, uh, you know, to make sure that that doesn't, obviously we're, we're, we are in unprecedented times with this pandemic. So it threw us all for a loop, but we are going to address that. Um, but I, I think Elliot Thompson is, is right when he said that, you know, the windjammers couldn't run. So, you know, you know, it, it makes sense to, to give them a, a, a furlough and, and the, the day sailors, they ran at least 50%. So you could charge them 50%, you know, what they usually uh, are charged. And that's a good guideline to give the select board. Uh, they might take it a different, a different, you know, route, but at least you got them on the right path. I think, I think we're looking at trouble here. Those, those agreements should have been sent out and they should have been signed and there should have been an addendum added that forgave the fee. Otherwise we're looking at um, starting all over from scratch, um, issuing agreements that are supposed to be three year agreements. Ron, I, I think you're completely correct there. I think the, the wind jammers certainly do need to to initiate their agreements and, and, yeah. and, and, and Ron, there were a lot of circumstances there. The timing of how we produced the agreements and, and that was specifically for the wind jammer, uh, the timing of the select board processing the, our, the agreements we gave them. And then we had the virus come in too and everything just, everything went bad. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I, I'm not I, discounting. I'm not move forward and get everybody under an agreement. You know exactly. I'm not discounting the difficulty that we faced back in April and March. I, I, I'm not ignoring that. It's just that moving forward, we should have those agreements signed, and the select board should forgive the fee to whatever extent they decide is appropriate. I think you can make, the board can make, uh, the committee can make a recommendation as to what we think is appropriate, but the select board is going to have to have the conversation and decide what they think is appropriate. They always do. So, so the bottom line, the recommendation is that, that we feel that, that the select board ought to forgive uh, some portion of the fees for, for the wind jammers. We've already we've already discussed the day sailors, but for the wind jammers, the select board should reduce some some portion of the fee. I I suggest that the wind jammers, if we've cut, if we're recommending that the day sailors be cut in half, then I'd be recommending that the wind jammer, the wind jammers who did not operate, would be signing their agreement as of last spring, and that the first years. Uh, permit fee be reduced to anywhere from uh, that it they pay a quarter or nothing, somewhere in that zone. I go along with that. And and the Ray Williamson thing is something else. And honestly, I would be thinking, well, he operated kind of like the uh, day sailor, so he's going to pay half his fee because he actually did operate. But I don't think we need to fine tune it. But they certainly shouldn't be paying any more than the. Yeah day sailors, and I think that it would be somewhere between zero and 25%. I endorse zero. Yeah, what, I think someone's gonna start making a motion here or we're gonna be here till 3 p.m. 
Yeah. Well, again, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a question of making a motion. It's like, we've gotten the, we've gotten the input from the board and the, the select board is looking for, for how we feel. Yeah. And you do that by making a motion and voting on it. Um, that's like, I'll make a vague motion that on the, the, uh, have we made any, any sort of motion on the uh, day sailors about the 50%? That I'll make a mo motion that we recommend, that we suggest that the select board consider uh, that the day sailor fee for the current year would only be 50% of the normal rate. And that for the wind jammers, the select board consider somewhere between zero and 25% of the normal annual rate. And that this count as their first year of their three year commitment. What was the percent 25? Maximum 25%. Zero, the, zero to 25? Yeah. And again, that, that this year count as the first year of their three year agreement. I'll second that. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I mean, we can't see the whole idea of, of creating the agreements was that they all fell due on the same date. So if we move that date up, then it just, the, all the dates become askew. Well, then none of them have been approved for it. I mean, the day sailors, nobody has a license. There's nobody in there. Their boats are sitting on our floats. The day sailors, have all, uh, day sailors have all signed their agreements. No, I'm talking about the wind jammers. Yeah. So, but the, the, those agreements, I mean, my, my suggestion was that those agreements go in effect as of last spring. That's what I, that's what I was saying. Oh, I'm sure. I the, the year count as the first year of the three-year agreement. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry. I misunderstood you. So it's been seconded. Let's, because I have to go to a staff meeting at okay. All in favor? Approved. Elliot Thompson, Elliot Thompson. Great. Elliot did not, the rest did, Elliot didn't. Okay. Uh, it's getting late. Yep. What do we want to do? I, I, Adjourn. Yeah, I'd <laughs> recommend we ask Janice to send us some dates. If that makes more sense than us suggesting a date to her. I believe next Tuesday will be fine if that's what you guys want to do. All right. The seventeenth will be okay. One question I have is: we actually did move along here, and so if we're on the thing, we're just down to like dinghy storage questions, and can we just roll that over to the next month? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Good point. So. Thank you. Is there any urgency on the memorial bench? Do the family need to know anything? Okay. Yeah. No. No urgency. No urgency. Cool. Okay. All right. So next, next meeting. meeting. I love you guys. The, the one other thing though is was under the Harbor redevelopment update, was that the Lyman Morse or was it the breakwaters? Because if it's Lyman Morse, I think we need to go on record as when the public visiting day is for folks to wrap their head around that. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that'll be in front of the planning board. So it'll be noticed in the paper uh, with the planning board. I'm sorry, Jeremy, it's up to you. Yeah, that is um, scheduled for next Thursday. What time? Uh, five o'clock. Um, those that would like to comment are, um, you can email me comments. Um, there you can also, um, we are gonna be able to provide Zoom links to people, but Let keep in on. mind that the number of people that can attend on Zoom is not, I think we're limited at 50. So people are gonna be allowed to make, Okay, but people are gonna be able to allowed to make one comment and then they'll go into the waiting room and they're not going to be able to participate other than in that time when they have um, a chance to speak during the public hearing. Um, but if you wanna be on the Zoom, get the Zoom link, reach out to me or Janice um, and then you can get that Zoom link. Um, other than that, we are taking public comment already. I've received a fair amount of comments already um, in writing um, by email. So um, feel free to share those if you'd like. Was there any you, part of your you report? Fill us in a little more. I'm not quite sure what we're talking about. 
Okay, I'm going to be very, very brief on this because you have your chair of the Harbor Committee is on the planning board. And he ought not be having any discussion about what's going to happen. So, or what's before them. Lyman Morris is proposing to um, um, replace, um, for the most part, in the exact footprint, plus or minus in some locations, um, the buildings that were damaged by fire this year, along with some other site improvements. Um, on the site as well. That's okay. going to the, the planning board did have a pre-application meeting with Lyman Morse. There's a site walk tomorrow, uh, Thursday morning. Um, and that's really for the planning board just to see on the face of the earth where things are going um, and how they're changing. And then there is a public hearing and site plan application next Thursday that goes before the planning board. So this isn't about the marina thing, it's about rebuilding the burn part. Per correct. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So just to clarify, in terms of our agenda, though, um, Jeremy was going to give us the Harbor Redevelopment Update, which was not about the Lyman Morse project, but was actually about um, the, the, the dams and um, Harbor Park oh. and all that. And I, I'm proposing that we don't do that today, but um, I just want to clarify, that's what the agenda is. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, and I don't have anything for you on that. I'm sorry. So let's do that another day. Yep. Great. So let's just roll it over. Meeting, 8.30, December 8th on Tuesday. Sure. Sounds good. I'm excellent at influence of drugs because I'm getting my knee replaced at some point in December. So that should well, be, be fun. I'll mute my mic. <laughs> nice. <No>. <laughs> All right, so we're adjourned then, Mr. Chairperson. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys. Mark? Yes. Before you end this meeting, can you see at the top where it says live on YouTube? Live.